The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of his betrayal, in his prayer, alongside his disciples, said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Life eternal, to know God and Jesus Christ. Conversely, the Apostle Paul wrote in the letter to the, to the Thessalonians that the Lord, when he is revealed from heaven, will take vengeance in flaming fire on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. So our objective this week is to have this topic help us come to know God. Our theme is the great secret of godliness. It's actually taken from Paul's letter to Timothy when he speaks about the great mystery of godliness. And the word mystery means the secret of godliness. And it really is a great secret which we're going to explore together. It's the subject of God manifestation, which is coming to know God and then coming to demonstrate God in our own personal lives. Now this little phrase, God manifestation, it's almost become a cliche for us as a community of Christadelphians, hasn't it? We talk about God manifestation being one of the fundamental doctrines of the truth. But God manifestation is about us coming to understand the existence of God, seeing his hand at work in our own personal lives, and then being changed by it so that we start to demonstrate his values in our own way of life. Brother Percy Mansfield made the comment more than 40 years ago that there is no more important theme in scripture than that of God manifestation. Because it's as we come to know God that it starts to have an effect on us. It changes our values and our perspective in life. As we develop an appreciation of God's hand, we see it at work in our own lives, we then start to see God's hand at work in our ecclesias. We learn to work together with God. And one of the most precious things of all is that it gives us confidence, courage and conviction as we look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We should probably also start with a little bit of a health warning. Um, this subject will stretch our minds. It's a very hard thing for small finite minds like ours to try and comprehend the almighty, the power of an eternal creator. Remember those words of the wise man Solomon in the book of Proverbs, when he wrote that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings is to search out that matter. And God in his glory has actually concealed in his words some very great truths. And it's our honor as kings of the future age to be able to search out those treasures from the scriptures. And it is a subject that's going to challenge and extend our minds as we search it out. Let's read a little extract here from the book of Phanerosis, which emphasizes this point. The deity delights in stimulating the intellect of his creatures. God loves stimulating our minds. In revealing himself, therefore, to them, he manifests himself mysteriously. It is the glory of the Elohim, says Solomon, to conceal a word, but it is the glory of kings to search out the word. A word is concealed when it is enigmatically expressed, and it is the glory of those whom God has chosen for his kings in the future government of the world to search out the wisdom that he hath hidden from the wise in their own conceits. So God has hidden some wonderful things in his word. They're expressed enigmatically. We have to work hard to be able to understand them. And when we do, we begin to discover the wonderful truths of the scriptures. Now, as may be guessed from that introduction, we're going to be drawing reasonably heavily on the book Phanerosis uh, during the course of our studies this week. It's a wonderful book written by Brother Thomas that drew out of obscurity a very wonderful subject. You know, our understanding of this topic sets us apart from the churches around us. I believe, actually, even more than our well-known rejection of the apostasy of the Trinity, I think this, the understanding of this particular topic is completely unique to the Brotherhood as a whole. Um, just a quick question. Does anybody know the origin of this book, the rather unusual circumstances of its birth? It was a debate with a Jew. 
there were actually two Jews who converted to Christianity. This is a long story, so I'll shorten it if I can. Uh, there was two Jews that converted to Christianity and they took, took their mission as, as being to convert the rest of the Jews to understand that Christianity was the, uh, was the right way. So they had a meeting. Uh, they got absolutely trounced. Um, the Jewish audience that they had uh, heckled them, uh, debated from the floor with them, and they had no success at all. And they'd, they'd come to hear of this John Thomas, who was quite a good debater, clearly of Christian persuasion. So they invited him along to come and explain why Christianity was the real way that the Jews should be embracing. So, of course, Brother Thomas came along and, as you would expect, stood up and said, well, Christianity is completely astray from the Bible, which they didn't like. The audience was spellbound. They listened in silence and respect. So these two Jews that had organised it were rather, their noses were put slightly out of joint, so they leapt their feet and passed a resolution that nobody should speak for more than five minutes, effectively thereby shutting Brother Thomas down. So what would you do? Well, he stood up and said, well, if anyone wants to hear the rest of the story, come and see us next week at this time in this place. And so then he had another meeting, and as he arrived, there was a Dr. Delara, who was a Jew, who gave him a list of questions for to cover, from to cover. And so he looked at the list of questions, and being fairly enterprising, he said, well, I'm clearly not going to be able to cover these all tonight, so how about you come along next week again at the same time? And Phanerosis is the record of those two nights where he set forth the truth, and he showed how the balance of Scripture shows that Christ, the whole Christian concept of the Trinity is totally wrong, but he was also enlightening the, the, the Jewish attendees there to help them understand how the Lord Jesus Christ was a manifestation of God. It's helpful to know that background, by the way, when you go through the book, because it helps us appreciate the, the structure and the logic flow of the book itself. And if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it uh, two or three times. You may need to read it two or three times. It is reasonably complex, but it's wonderful in terms of the way it brings out some, some very powerful principles of the truth. All right, well, where do we start? Let's start perhaps with this word manifestation. As I said before, it's a word, God, manifestation, that we tend to use quite frequently. So what does the word manifestation mean? Well, it's a Bible word. So the first thing to do is get hold of a Greek concordance and have a look at the word itself. And in the Greek, the word manifestation is the Greek word phanerosis. <clears throat> it's not hard to see where the book got its name from. Uh, it comes from a verb, phanerou, which means to make visible, or to uncover, or to lay bare. There's an adjective, phaneros, which means to be open to sight, visible, or manifest. So that when we look at uh, perhaps this lectern here, we say, well, this lectern is uh, it's phaneros, it's open to sight, it's able to be seen. So there's nothing difficult to comprehend about this word, it simply means something is able to to be seen. An example of it, we won't turn it up, but in 1st of Corinthians chapter 3, now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, which means visible or open. But there's got to be more to it than just this idea of being able to be seen, because often the word is used of God being able to be made manifest. And when we look a little further, we find that the word has come from the Greek word, the Greek root, phaino, which means to cause to shine. And it's derived from the root phao, or phos, which has the idea of light. So that tells us that this idea of manifestation comes from an original foundation of the idea of light. That's as far as the Greek lexicons can take us. But of course, if we want to understand a scriptural phrase or theme, the very best way we can do that, and it's a very, a very useful key, isn't it, for all of us with our own personal Bible study, if we want to understand a scriptural concept, the best thing to do is to pick it up and simply to have a look at how it's used in scripture, in context, and just gently build a profile of what that word or idea or concept represents in scripture. So let's go and do that. Let's simply have a look at this word phanerosis and how it's used in scripture and see if we can build up a better appreciation than simply the, the bare meaning of the Greek phrases. 
I'd like you to come with me first of all to 1st of Corinthians chapter 4. In this passage, the verb fanaru, to make something manifest, is, uh, is used. 1st of Corinthians and chapter 4. Now I'd like you to notice the association of ideas here in this particular passage. It's in the context of the judgment seat. 1st of Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore... Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall every man have praise of God. When it says he will make manifest, Weymouth says openly disclose the counsels of the heart. Now note the two ideas here that are linked very closely together. The Lord's described as doing two things. First of all, to bring to light hidden things of darkness, and secondly, to make manifest the counsels of the heart. So we've got a close association here of two ideas, light and manifestation. All right, let's go now to Ephesians chapter 5. And Ephesians chapter 5 and verse uh, 13, the Apostle Paul uses the same phrase again. Again, it's interesting actually to see the context here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 13. All things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So once again, we've got these themes of manifestation and light inseparably linked together. Why? Well, the very thing that makes something manifest is light. Now, when you think about it, that's rather logical, isn't it? The only reason that this lectern here in front of us is fanaroo, visible or manifest, is because there's light here. And if someone went over to the light switch and switched off all the lights in here, well, suddenly we would no longer be able to see the lectern. So the idea of manifestation is completely impossible in the absence of light. Because it is light which makes something visible, manifest, or revealed. All right, let's go now to John chapter 3. Once again, we're going to find these same principles of light uh, very clearly linked with the idea of manifestation. But this time, the topic moves on to start talking about people and about people's behavior. It's a defining characteristic of those who come to the light. John chapter 3, uh, in verse 19. This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. So once again, we've got this close association of light and manifestation. But here he's saying that actually people who come to the light do so because they've been doing the works of truth. So they don't mind when the light of the truth makes their deeds manifest. And now at this point, we're suddenly saying, ah, this is starting to become a, a subject which is rather revealing. This is suggesting that this is light which, which opens us up. The truth does that, doesn't it? You know, when we come to the truth, brothers and sisters, it doesn't take very long for the truth to actually open us up and make it very clear what our values in life are. The light makes things very manifest. And we start to look at passages which talk about bringing to light the hidden things of darkness and revealing or making manifest the counsels of our heart. I wonder what will be seen, brothers and sisters, when all the hidden things of our hearts are opened up. That's what the subject of manifestation or phanerosis is all about. It's actually about a light which opens up things which were otherwise hidden. 
But once again here in this passage we find that this idea of light and manifestation are very closely linked together. And it conveys in our mind, doesn't it, the idea of a brilliant shining light which radiates down and because it's so bright it opens up and makes obviously visible something for us to be able to see. Well the next logical question is, well where does the light come from? So let's sort of step back a bit and think about that and we say, well, we've got electric lights in here, that's man-made. Well the sun itself makes things light, but where does the very notion of light itself come from? First of John 1 verse 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And here is our second key, brothers and sisters. Right at its heart, the very essence of the theme of manifestation is God himself. God is the light source that makes things manifest and visible. So if something is lifted up to view and made manifest or visible because the light shines down upon it from a scriptural point of view, it is the work of God. So let's try and capture this if we can as a, as a diagram. We start off with a general principle that God is light. That light then shines down upon things and makes them manifest. So if it's a person that comes along, as Christ described in John chapter 3, they come along to the light of the truth which shines down upon them and it makes them very manifest as to what sort of character they are. God's truth makes us manifest or open or visible to other eyes. But what we've got represented there on the screen is only half the story. The idea of God's light shining down, making something manifest is only half of our theme. If you're still there in John chapter 3, verse 21, there are six little words at the end of the verse which we ignored. Just tacked on gently there at the end of the verse. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now this adds a very rich dimension to our topic. Provides an insight into the second phase or aspect of the subject of God manifestation. In fact, those little words really reveal the purpose of God manifestation, what it's really about. Someone who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that those deeds have been wrought in God. What's he saying? What's happening in this particular process? Well, it means that somebody else comes along, another party, a bystander. And they look at that person, they look at their deeds, they look at their behaviour, and what do they see? They say, that's interesting, that behaviour, those deeds have been wrought in God. And the behaviour of that person attracts the attention of the observer back to the Heavenly Father himself. They see a truthful or faithful person manifesting certain deeds and it's obvious to them as a bystander that those deeds have come from God. In other words, the person in the middle is living a life that helps the observer come to understand and see God. That is the foundation key to God manifestation. Yes, the light from God does light things up. But the purpose of the light, brothers and sisters, the whole purpose of the truth, is so that other people might see those deeds that they are wrought in God. So when somebody else comes along and they see those things, their attention is directed back to God. When they come along and they see that object or whatever it is, what do they see? They see a reflection of the glory of God. That is the essence of God manifestation. And that's the purpose of our life in the truth. That's the role of our ecclesias. That's the role of our Bible schools. In fact, that's the very reason for our existence. That's why we're alive. That's why you and I are here on God's planet. So that others can come along 
and see a manifestation of the character and the values and the principles of God so that their minds in turn are directed back to the God who made us. Our aspirations are not for our own pride, our own comfort, our own advancement in this life. In fact, not even primarily for our own eternal salvation, although of course that is important. But the main objective of our life, brothers and sisters, is that all attention can be focused back on our Heavenly Father. Now just keep looking at that diagram and listen to these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's God manifestation. That's the simple essence of the truth that we've been called to. That's the motivating force in our lives, brothers and sisters. That's our perspective on life. That's what it's all about. That's what we want to teach to our children and in our ecclesias. All our views, all our opinions, all our values in life are predicated upon that great touchstone. It's a spirit that transforms a life. Quite simply, it's utterly revolutionary because it changes the way a person thinks and it changes the way a person lives. But you know the truly amazing thing? As we go through this subject, not only does it change the way in which we live, not only does it draw attention back to our Heavenly Father, but there's another most remarkable power in the subject as well. It's something that somehow reaches out and it embraces us and it draws us into that subject as well. So that when a person comes along and they observe something which manifests God, demonstrates the values of God to them, it begins to work on them also. It converts them. So that they in turn then become their own manifestation of God's values and principles and glory. They become a manifestation of the truth to other people. And that's the extraordinary power of the gospel of salvation. It's a subject which draws us in and converts us so we then can show forth those principles to other people and become part of that work. It's the process or the ongoing cycle of the truth. That's the great work which Yahweh has been doing with this earth for a thousand years. When he says, truly I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh, that's how he's intending to do it. This is the process of bringing many sons to glory as the Apostle describes it in Hebrews 2 verse 10. It's also what our work will continue to be, God willing, in the kingdom, with the mortal population that still exists on the earth. And at this point, brothers and sisters, the theme of God manifestation is not a two-dimensional mechanical doctrine. It's not just black ink on a white page. It's a spirit, brothers and sisters, that sets us on fire in our hearts as we understand the whole purpose of our life is to demonstrate the glory of God in everything that we actually do. So that as sons and daughters of the living God, we get drawn into this topic so that those values define our behavior and our speech as a manifestation of the glory of God. Well, a question for us at this stage is why has God chosen to use that sort of a mechanism? Why does he, why does he choose a process like that? Why does he choose to use medium to be able to display his glory to others? Why do people need to learn about God through seeing it displayed in other things? Why has God chosen to use vessels or vehicles through it to manifest himself? Well, let's go back to Exodus chapter 33 because the reason for that is very simple. As we're turning up Exodus 33, just remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 1 verse 18 when he said, no man hath seen God at any time. Now, the context of, of Exodus chapter 33 <clears throat> is Moses in his discussions with the Heavenly Father. It's around the time of the, uh, of the golden calf, of course. And Moses is speaking to God. And, of course, he has an extraordinary relationship with the Father. 
he worked together with God as he brought Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt and he was going to be involved in carrying them through the wilderness. And he earnestly desired the comfort and the reassurance of being able to see the glory of the Father himself. And so in Exodus 33, in verse 18, he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God says, well, Moses, I'll, I'll pass my goodness before thee. I'll declare the name of Yahweh before me. But verse 20, you can't see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now, they're very simple words, but it's very valuable for us to stop and consider what they convey. No man shall see me and live. There is something so splendid, so glorious, and all-consuming in its power in the face of Yahweh that no flesh can stand alive in the presence of God himself. That's something for us to think about, isn't it? Every time we pray to that glorious being. So God took Moses and, and he hid him in the cleft of the rock. He placed his hand across him. He caused his glory to go past and as he went past, he removed his hand so that Moses could see the back parts or the after effect of the glory of Yahweh which had gone past. And the mere hinder part of the glory of God was so powerful that it changed the cells in the face of Moses so that his own face began to shine and glow. So that as he walked down the mountain and rejoined Israel, they were terrified of Moses' face and ran away to hide. That's the power of the glory of God, just the back parts after the full glory of God had gone past. It gives us a faint inkling of the glory and the power that belongs to Yahweh himself. No Moses, no man can see my face and live. Reminds us of the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16, of God dwelling in light which no man can approach unto. When we think about that sort of power, that, that even that faint glimpse of the back part of it had such an enormous impact on Moses physically, then a modicum of respect and awe begins to form in our own minds as we consider the glory of the presence of God. But God wants to teach us about himself. He wants us to come to know him and love him as our father. But he can't communicate with us face to face or we can't commune with him face to face because no man can see his face and live. So if we're going to come to understand the character of God, come to love him and know him as a father, he has to choose certain things to use to teach us of his ways, to teach us about his character, to teach us about his purpose with him. And that's precisely what he's done. He has tailor-made some specific mechanisms to help us to come to know him and to love him. He knows our frame, he knows our mind, he knows our weaknesses, our abilities, he knows how we work. So he's tailor-made a series of things which are perfectly designed to help men and women come to know and to understand him. Here are some of the things that he's used. Obviously the word of life itself. But his name that was referred to there in Exodus 33, when Moses asked to see his glory, he said, okay, I'll declare it in my name. The titles of God. He sent forth his son as a manifestation of himself. The cherubim, the angels, symbology in scripture, the servants of God. These are all things that God has used to teach us of his values and his principles and his ways. And every one of those things designed to help us to come to know and understand our Heavenly Father better. Now bear in mind that these things were not designed for the angels. In fact, they weren't even designed for perfect men. They were designed to teach men and women like you and me about the ways of God. So they're perfectly designed for that purpose. They work. So we have the assurance, brothers and sisters, that if we come to understand the way in which God has taught us about himself in Scripture and through some of those things there, it will enrich our understanding of our Heavenly Father wonderfully. And those concepts, those themes there, basically form 
the foundation for each of our studies as we go through uh, the course of our studies together this week. And every one of those things is able to take our minds and focus us back on understanding and enriching our understanding of aspects of the work of our Heavenly Father. Now once we lock on to this framework, we find that all sorts of passages in Scripture open up and they start being clothed with rather wonderful meaning. I'd like you to come with me to 1st of Peter chapter 1. 1st of Peter chapter 1, again a reasonably complex verse, but just read it with the, the diagram that we've had here in mind and all of a sudden it becomes quite, quite straightforward. 1st of Peter 1 chapter 18 and verse, uh, sorry, chapter 1 and verses 18 to 21. He said, you're not redeemed with corruptible things, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So Christ was manifested for us, who by him do believe in God. Notice how it's working again. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ now being manifested to us, who by him believe in God. Why? Well, he goes on to say, We believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, so that our faith and our hope might be in God. And that's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, to strengthen our belief in God so that our faith and our hope might be in God. That's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, being a manifestation of the Father, so that our faith and our hope might be in God. That is the point of God manifestation. All right, let's go back now to the reading, which was read for us together this afternoon in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And you know, the subject of God manifestation just breathes through this particular chapter, 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. We won't spend much time looking at the first part of the chapter, but it's wonderful to see in verse 2 how the Apostle Paul says that we, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We don't walk in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is the Apostle Paul speaking about how he preached and what he preached. It was by a manifestation of the truth that he commended himself to people's conscience in the sight of God. Because the Apostle Paul didn't just give words, brothers and sisters, he lived it as his way of life. He was a powerful manifestation of the principles of the truth to those to whom he was communicating. A manifestation of the truth that they could see. But look at verse 3. If our gospel's hid, it's hid to them who are lost. It's a horrible phrase that, isn't it? It's a terrible phrase. A gospel hid to those who are lost. He said, those are the people in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds of those which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who was the image of God, should shine unto them. What's that telling us? It's telling us that it's possible, brothers and sisters, for someone to be blinded. So they actually can't see the light of the glory of the glorious gospel of Christ. They're unable to see what is being conveyed. So all the splendor of the glory of God is completely hidden to them because they just can't see it. You know, brothers and sisters, if we ever turn away from God, it's because we've lost sight of that glory. But what is it that can blind us so that we can't see? The apostle says there, it's the God of this world who has blinded their minds. You know, that's a really scary picture because it's telling us that there are two gods. There's the true God and there's the God of this world. And there's a conflict here, brothers and sisters, inside our own hearts and minds. Two gods, opposing forces, both trying to work on our minds and they compete for loyalty. You know, the really nasty trick of the God of this world is it comes along with a great big awl and it bores out your eyes so you can no longer actually see the glory of God. We need to appreciate that the world that we live in today blinds us if we let it. That something about the world, the God of this world, takes away from the ability to see the glorious, uh, glory of God 
and it removes that power until the person is completely blind, unable to ever see the glory of God. Remember those words of Brother Carter in his little book on the letter to the Ephesians. He said, the mind insensibly is affected by the stream of thoughts passing through it, and it is desirable to have the stream as pure as possible. A mind familiarized by pictures of evil is not strongly fortified if sin should assail. Those are extremely wise words. The mind insensibly is affected by the stream of thought passing through it. It tells us we need to be very careful with our eyes and our minds. We need to exercise great care over what they see and we have great care over what our mind is filled with. And if we fill them with the things of this world, step by bitter step, it will bore out our eyes until insensibly we've been blinded and unable to perceive the glorious values and principles of God. And then in verse 4 he says, they're unable to see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who's the image of God, it can no longer shine into their hearts. So if we want our eyes to be single, brothers and sisters, then we must turn our eyes and our minds to the things which will help us see and away from things in life which will blind us. We have to actually decide that that's what we want to do, very deliberately in the choices that we make in our own personal lives. And it does actually mean making some deliberate choices. What do we read? What do we watch? What do we look at as we drive down the road? What do we think about? Now test ourselves. One of the very revealing tests is for us to ask ourselves, what's the last thing we think about at night when we go to sleep? What's the first thing we think about in the morning when we wake up? What are our priorities in life? Is our eye single? Is our whole body full of light? At times, you know, brothers and sisters, it means saying, I know that that's a problem for me. I'm not going to go there because it's going to do lasting damage to me. I know that that, whatever it is, is taking my mind so I'm going to avoid it. Those activities, those films, that music, those friends, those sites on the internet, they're things which will blind our minds. They represent the God of this world. So I'm going to make a conscious choice to do something about it. You know, it's funny, isn't it? General musings of the heart, sort of vague general intentions to do something about it at some stage. They're well nigh useless, aren't they? We know, each of us personally, sitting here today, we know the things that distract us from the word of God and from the things of the truth. We know what those things are in our own lives, don't we? Well, we need to see those things as being the great big ugly God of this world with a big all trying to bore out our eyes to blind us. So we can't understand anymore the things of God's truth. And we need to say, oh, I'm just not going to go there anymore. So what do we do instead? Well, we commit our hearts and our minds to the things that bring light, true enlightenment. And the psalmist says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. Psalm 119 verse 130. And we've got the wonderful antidote. It's given to us, isn't it, in the scriptures and that's the safeguard against blindness. It's the entrance of God's word that gives us light. So we need, first of all, to put the daily reading of God, of God's word, right at the top of our priority list as families. So that the daily Bible readings defines what our family home is all about, or our own personal lives. We need to teach our children that that's important for them. So that if for some reason the family hasn't been able to get together that night to do the readings, well, our children want to do them, and so they do the readings themselves before they go to bed at night. Let's look at how we can focus our recreation time. 
our relaxation time around the things of the ecclesia. To make our homes, our families, our ecclesias havens for the truth. Not part of our week, but everything we do, brothers and sisters, within the ambit of those principles and, and, and values and philosophies. Resolving so that every time we make decisions in life, whatever it is we decide to do, and it doesn't matter how formal or informal, whether it's recreational or whatever it does, we always test it against that great touchstone. Will it help me? Will it help my husband? Will it help my wife? Will it help my ecclesia? Will it help my children? Will it help my friends? Will it help us to better demonstrate God's values and glory in our life? Now in that context, let's see how the Apostle Paul continues here in verse uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, picking it up in verse 6. He said, because God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. These are these same principles, brothers and sisters, just breathing out of the narrative here. Here's God. He shined down in our hearts. How? Well, he's trying to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? Seen in the face of Jesus Christ, a manifestation of the glory of God. And that light, he says, is shining in our hearts. That's what the truth is able to do for us, brothers and sisters. But why does he start off there in verse 6 with this little reference, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness? What's he referring to? Well, he's directing our minds all the way back, isn't he, to Genesis chapter 1, to the process of creation. And what were the opening words of the creative process? God said, let there be light, and there was light. The very foundation principle upon which the whole of the rest of the creation was then going to be based was the creation of light itself. Even before the sun was created, brothers and sisters, forth from the presence of the Father himself came this whole concept of light. And at his command, darkness was dispelled. The radiant glory of light was the first foundation principle of the work of creation. It's embodied there right at the beginning. Light came as the effect of God's word, his command. He commanded and light shone forth. And our Heavenly Father saw that those principles were so important that he saw fit to emblazon those principles across the opening act of creation. It was the grand opening chords of the symphony of creation, as it were, with this foundation principle, let there be light. And what then unfolds in the, in the defined structure of the work of creation is the creation template or process that God uses in all his creative work. So as we start to look through those seven perfectly structured days, we find that it actually talks about the way God creates all his beings. And we're described as starting like the earth, without form and void, no shape, no structure, empty, black, in darkness, and God's creative work with you and I starts, brothers and sisters, with the command, let there be light. That's the process here that he's describing. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. So that, brothers and sisters, in our hearts should dwell the light of the knowledge of the glory of God himself. That's what he wants in our hearts seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So how do we feel about that when we look in the mirror? Do you feel like a brilliant example of God's glory? Do we feel really confident up to the task? Do we feel like we're dazzling brilliant examples of the glory of God? in our own personal lives? Is this process easy for us to be able to achieve? Just think about the splendor of the subject, the glory of God himself to be revealed by all of us. Does that sound like a good description of us? A great revealing of the dazzling glory of God to the world around us? We stop and we look at ourselves in our own personal lives in our own daily existence. We become conscious of our own failings 
our own weaknesses, the things that we know we should have done but we didn't do them, or trials and tribulations in life, things we seem to stumble at from time to time. And when we compare that to what we've been called to, we can be left feeling a little despondent, can't we? Because on one hand, we've got the glory and splendor of the Creator himself. And on the other hand, we have, well, we have us. And we say, well, how, how are we going to get that glory inside us? How are we going to end up becoming such a glorious depiction of the glory of God? With all our failings and with all our character, we're not a very spectacular demonstration of it at times, are we, brothers and sisters? You know, our Heavenly Father actually understands our frame. He understands our heart. And he understands what needs to happen with us. And just look at these next words, brothers and sisters. They're remarkable words. Simple, but very profound and comforting words. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. When it says an earthen vessel, it has the idea of a clay jar or a clay pot. Now, if we were to pick up a clay pot, say a clay flower pot, and look at it, there's not a lot of glory or splendor in a clay pot, is there, brothers and sisters? Now, just imagine if we had a clay pot sitting on a shelf, perhaps in our garage or in our garden shed at home. We walk into the shed one night, and to our astonishment, there's a brilliant, shining light shining forth, radiating from that pot. Incandescent brilliance radiating out from that clay pot sitting there on the shelf. We wouldn't look at it and say, oh, the clay pot's shining. <laughs> it always does that, would we? You'd say, wow, what's that? Light shining from a clay pot. Clay pots don't shine. We'd go dashing over there. We'd pick it up. We'd want to understand what it was that was making that clay jug shine. Clay jugs just don't shine by themselves. The apostle says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So that when there is a manifestation of the glory of God in us, brothers and sisters, people will say... I wonder what it is that makes those people shine like that. What is this gospel that they believe? And that's why Paul says it's so that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. And in his extraordinary love and mercy, brothers and sisters, our Heavenly Father is able to work with vessels like us and teach us clay jugs as we are to learn how to show forth his glory so that other people can come to understand that the excellency of their power belongs to God and not to us. You know, it's a very comforting thought, brothers and sisters, for us to hold on to when the journey seems very difficult or very long. Because sometimes we do really struggle with our life in the truth. It might be the pressure of trying to teach our children the values of God in a godless world. It may be distress caused by things within our own personal families. It may be anxiety and grief at things in ecclesial life. It may be the, the influence of the world tearing away the fabric of the brotherhood. It may be struggles that we have in our own personal lives to live the truth, wrestlings with wayward consciences or thoughts. It might be that times we feel tired or old or depressed or terribly alone with burdens that we have to carry. Sometimes we toil under distressing financial burdens or burdens of sickness and ill health. Whatever it is, brothers and sisters, there come times in the lives of every single saint, every brother and every sister, when we feel all but overwhelmed with a feeling of consuming weakness, of helplessness. And that's when we need to understand, as Paul says, yes, we do carry this glorious treasure in a clay pot. And there's a reason, brothers and sisters, for our frailty. It is because we are flesh, but we need to appreciate that what it actually means is that the excellency of the power is not yours or mine. It doesn't belong to us. 
the excellency of the power, brothers and sisters, actually belongs with God himself. He is the one who makes it possible. And at that point, there's no room left for pride, is there? There's no room left for feeling really good about ourselves. There's nothing left for us to revel in because the excellency of their power belongs to God. And that's what the subject of God manifestation is all about. The brightness of the splendor of the truth is able to be manifested in something that is only a clay jug, but the glory and the honor and the excellency belongs to Yahweh and not to us. Now, if only we could adopt that as the principle upon which every aspect of ecclesial life was to work, imagine what a difference it would make in every single one of our ecclesias. No room for pride. No room for petty jealousies. No room for getting huffy or feeling offended at what someone else has done or ought to have done to me. Only the all-consuming awareness that in God's grace, he's called people like you and me to a knowledge of the glorious gospel of God shown in the face of Jesus Christ so that we can then show that to others. That's what it means for us to come to know God. It's a perspective, brothers and sisters, which does transform our life. It does become the touchstone for all decision-making in our homes. If I do this thing, if I speak in this way, if I buy this thing, or wear that thing, or take this job, or drive this thing, whatever it is that we decide to do in life, the touchstone is, will it better help me manifest God to those around? Will it result in God's honor and glory being recognized more than it is now? And if not, then it's not for me. Because truly, brothers and sisters, these principles are the foundation for a transformed life. It is the most powerful tool in the toolkit for the life of the saints. Let's just con conclude, brothers and sisters, with the words of Jeremiah chapter 9. Thus saith Yahweh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am Yahweh, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Yahweh.